IT stocks plunge after analysts reset expectations following Infosys disappointment in the fourth quarter. Even capital goods lose ground, but FMCG and utilities buck the trend. Infosys shocks investors by missing its growth guidance for the first time in six years. Concerns over deal cancellations and ramp downs across key sectors drags the stock and its peers lower. HDFC Bank slips as the near-term impacts of branch expansion and liability mobilization rein in on profitability, but asset quality improves and margins remain stable. TV18 gains after Viacom18 closes a deal with Bodhi Tree Systems and Geo Cinema, while a sale of 5.7% equity by Oppenheimer and Z Entertainment weighs on the stock. Hello and welcome to Halftime Report. I'm Sonia Shanoi and with me as always Ekta Batra and Mangala Malu. Well, the market has opened on the back foot today. There's a bit of a recovery that you're seeing. It's largely uh, the IT stocks which are under pressure. But now there's a bit of semblance of sanity that's come back into the market. So the Nifty, you know, get trying to claw back above that 17,700 mark. Um, today, of course, is all about IT, but through the course of the week, we have plenty of other numbers to watch out for. There's Reliance at the end of the week, there's ICICI Bank on Saturday, and 20% of the Nifty components come out with their numbers this week itself. So it's going to be a pretty heavy week in terms of, uh, you know, triggers, trends, and earnings. Uh, so we have our hands full, perhaps. Hi, guys. Yes, we do. But it's not particularly a bad day, you know, give or take everything. I, I'd say that mainly because the Nifty is down, what, 170 points. Most of it is because of Infosys. HDFC Bank is under pressure, but at the same time, the Nifty Bank has seen a recovery, some support coming in from Kotak Mahindra Bank, and the mid-cap index is doing extremely well. In fact, the story of the day, perhaps, would be the way the advanced decline lines have moved. Uh, this morning, we saw weakness from across the board. But thereafter, the Nifty has recovered about 100 points from the lows. And the advanced decline crisscross lines come up for you. They're at the closest that they have been all through this uh, trading session so far. So we have around, uh, you know, split right down the middle. At, some, at one point, we had about 1,800 to 2,000 stocks declining for every 1,000 stocks which were advancing. And now those lines are coming closer. So maybe at some point, we will see them intersect and, uh, you know, more stocks advance than decline. We'll watch out for how it pans out. Well, yes, uh, Manglam Sonia, you know, one of the key cues that we will be working with now is the WPI data for the month yeah. of March, which should be coming out. Uh, so that is expected to s uh, see quite a downtick on a month-on-month -month basis. So we will be waiting by for the WPI data. But nonetheless, in terms of other cues to watch out for for the markets, remember that it is definitely emphasis, which is dented sentiment at a fresh 52-week low. But remember that other stocks within the IT space are also at fresh 52-week lows. For example, Wipro as well as emphasis would be case in point. So that spillover effect for the next couple of days is what the street will be watching out for. Select financials, FMCG seem to really be ruling the roost today. So let's see whether that sustains or not. But nonetheless, uh, we do have a lot of stocks which we have to track in terms of news while we wait for the WPI data for the month of March. HDFC Bank. That stock is under pressure after the bank reported its fourth quarter numbers this weekend. Abhishek Kathari is here with us to give us the highlights and what might really be plaguing the stock this time. Abhishek. Uh, well, the bank is building on for future traction, so the cost is being incurred right now. Uh, however, asset quality and the quality of the portfolio remains impeccable. So what has worked in this quarter is that despite rising cost of funds, the net interest margin has remained stable. And NIA growth on a YY basis is pretty strong at 23-24%. The slippage ratio of 1.2% is perhaps the lowest in last six quarters and second lowest in last 31 quarters. So that helps the asset quality remaining stable with gross NPA ratio being the lowest lowest in last nine quarters. ROA remains robust, uh, that is return on asset, it remains at 2.1%, with PCR or provision coverage ratio being the best in last nine quarters, above 75%. Uh, so RWA to advances ratio is at uh, the lowest in four quarters, and the second lowest in 17 quarters or more, which suggests that, you know, the book is being built in a secured manner with lower risk. Restructured book at mere 0.3% is the lowest in last 10 quarters, and HDB Financial has reported 
strong numbers. The PAT is the highest quarterly PAT that they have seen with asset quality being the best in last nine quarters. What has not worked in the result is the operating efficiency given the fact that OPEX remains elevated due to the branch expansion that they have taken. So the cost to income ratio is at 42%, perhaps the highest that you are seeing in last 25 quarters. And CASA growth rate or the low cost deposit growth rate is the lowest in last uh, three quarters. For third quarter in a row, you are seeing CASA growth being below the overall deposit growth. This is a trend seen across industry peers as well. Corporate loan growth, YOY is below the overall loan growth. And in terms of PNL, NIN PAT is below our poll. Back to you. Okay, all right, Abhishek, thanks very much for that. So the WPI data for the month of March is flashing on your screens. And in fact, it's come in lower than what the street has anticipated. It's come in at around 1.34%. So it's around 30, 30 basis points lower than our expectation of 1.6%. Remember, this is a multi-month low for the WPI data, which had in any case come in at a 25-month low in the previous month at around 3.85%. So now it has softened further, even much more more than what the street was anticipating at around 1.6%. Just want to put it into perspective, we are waiting by for the core data as well. And the core could even be a sub 1% figure, which compares to 2.5% in the previous month. Now, it is expected to, uh, you know, the reason for the softening this time round was because of reasons such as a high base plus continued easing in industrial commodity prices. In fact, the CRB commodity index was down by around 0.8% on a month-on-month -month basis in in the month of March. So remember, this ties in quite well with the CPI data, which came in at around 5.7%. Core CPI came in lower than 6% for the first time in six months. So maybe this would just be an added incentive for the Reserve Bank of India to probably maintain, it, maintain its whole stance, which it did for the first time since its rate tightening cycle in May of 2022. We do have some, uh, you know, uh, internal details from mm -hmm. the WPI. Fuel and Power Group index is down about 1.3% on the month. Primary index is up 1.2%. And the only thing which is actually higher than every other uh, uh, class here is the vegetable index, which is up 5.5% on the month. Apart from that, we are seeing significant contraction on uh, the cereals index, down about 1.9%. Edible oils down about 2.6% manufactured product products down by about 0.3% as well. So among the heads that have been revealed so far, uh, we have food inflation, which is at 2.32%. And that's largely led perhaps on account of vegetable index, which is up 5.5%. Manufactured products, edible oils, cereal and fuel and power, all of them have contracted month on month. I think the RBI preempting a lot of this, right? I mean, uh, they very decisively came out with that pause uh, in the previous policy. And the verdict was out. Now mm. inflation, of course, has started to cool off. So I guess, uh, you know, the, R the inflation targeting was the policy that the RBI had put out. So perhaps anticipating a cooling off yes. of inflation, uh, they uh, have... And Ekta, we have the core WPI data as well. <laughs> you know, core WPI is 0.1%. Yeah. You thought it would be closer to 1, but yeah. it's 0.1%. It was supposed to come in at a sub 1% yeah. figure. So, you know, the data this time round, yes, supported by a base impact uh, and the industrial commodity softening. But nonetheless, this would definitely be more fodder for the Reserve Bank of India to probably con continue that whole stance which they started in uh, just a couple of weeks ago when they had the RBI policy. So that's uh, the March WPI data. The food inflation has softened all the way to around 2.3%. Mm. versus 2.76%. So good going in terms of the data points that are flashing on your screen. Fuel and power inflation, inflation down to around 8.96%. It's a single digit figure as compared to double digits in the previous month. Also, manufactured products is a deflation of around 0.7%. So also, you know, uh, I mean, hats off to the RBI, right? Uh, there were so many questions being asked when the policy came through as to what prompted them to pause on rate yeah. hikes when inflation continues to be so high. But now, as we progress, the inflation is cooling off quite a bit. I just saw fuel and power inflation has come off substantially compared to what we saw last month. Uh, so I guess kudos to them. Yes, absolutely. But the Reserve Bank of India did say that they are going to be entirely data dependent and you cannot go by their hold, uh, mm -hmm. you know, stance which they undertook this time round. But nonetheless, this would definitely be more data uh, for them to probably continue that whole stance. Rupa Rege of l &T Financial Services joins in to discuss the WPI data for the month of March. Rupa, your first thought score is a sub 1% figure. March WPI is lower than what at least consensus was working with. Oh, yeah, this is a pleasant surprise, but um, yes, we all had expected it to uh, slow to 1.6%. Uh, 
1.34 percentage way below that but uh, if you look at the uh, trajectory of global uh, commodity prices i think both energy as well as non energy products minerals metals etc barring precious metals uh their prices had uh, you know inflation in these uh, commodities had uh, declined quite significantly in the month of march and since uh, our wpi is very sensitive to global commodity inflation uh, uh this is in line with expectations Arupa, hi. Welcome to the show. What does this mean? I mean, the RBI verdict is obviously out. They have already gone ahead with the pause mode. But do you reckon that this is a stance that could continue for a while? And uh, do you believe that this is the end of the rate tightening cycle, at least in India? Uh, there is a very high probability to expect that. But you know, currently we are facing many uncertainties. uh because of uh, first of all this opec plus um, output cuts and uh, in last one month we have seen oil prices again have uh, risen uh, by uh, you know 8 9 dollars uh, globally uh, and our inflation is very sensitive to that secondly uh, we had seen in the month of april uh, a lot of administered prices uh, uh, have gone up like electricity uh, tariffs etc even milk product prices have gone up so uh, personally i feel that you know uh, uh, before we making any inference about the trend i think we need to wait and watch for few more observations right uh, and uh, you know what kind of bearing do you expect this to be uh, on the cpi which is the data point that uh, you know the central bank uses for its forecast i mean with uh, this coming in at 1.3% going forward what are your cpi and wpi expectations yeah because now uh, base effect uh, will turn increasingly favorable for both cpi and wpi if you remember last year around this time uh, because of the breaking out of war between ukraine and russia huge supply disruption had taken place so most of the global commodity prices had spiked around that time so you know basically it will uh, turn favorable luckily we are also having um, very good uh, rabi uh, uh, you know uh, crop um, uh, harvest etc so that uh, should have because in this wpi also we have seen uh, you know huge uh, uh, deflation in uh, edible oil uh, price inflation even food inflation has slowed quite a lot but uh, you see we also cannot completely ignore uh, the implications of uh, climate change and climate risks we are facing mm-hmm. lot of heat storms and seasonal rains and uh, perishable prices are highly vulnerable to that so one has to see but yes base effect will act as a buffer for coming to quarters so we may not uh, you know in very high probability we may not see early uh, rains Uh, for both WPI as well as CPI, sequentially there could be some increase, uh, 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 you know, that cannot be ruled uh, ruled out. But uh, uh, you see, overall, I O Y inflation numbers will look benign. Okay, all right, Rupa. We're going to leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us. So that's the word coming in on the WPI March data, which in fact has come in at an over two-year low. It's a 29-month low, which it's come in at. It's accelerated in terms of the uh, reduction that we've seen in terms of the WPI data as compared to the previous month, which was at a 25-month low. So definitely a positive in terms of what the Reserve Bank of India might do. Remember, they did hold after six consecutive. Rate hikes that they had undertaken. Time for a short break. We'll get you more on the markets and stocks once we're back. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, well, for the markets, we have the mid-cap index, which is just about holding its head above the water, so up around 20 odd points currently for the mid-cap index. Bank Nifty absolutely flat. It's given up a little bit of its gains, so the intraday chart will tell you more. Infosys still reeling under pressure and dragging the entire IT space down with it. Techm, there was a brokerage note on Techm today as well. That stock is down around five odd percent. HCL Tech, Wipro. All of these stocks down anywhere between two and a half to three odd percent at this point in time. But let's talk about specific stocks. TV18 and Network18 are in focus after Viacom18 has completed its partnership agreement with Bodhi Tree and Paramount Global. Surbi is here with the details on this transaction. Surbi. 
Thanks for that. So Viacom 18, a subsidiary of TV18 over the weekend, has announced the completion of the strategic partnership with Bodhichi and Paramount Global. Now, post this deal, Viacom 18 will own the Geo Cinema ODD platform. The completion of this deal was on expected lines. However, there are two interesting aspects to this. First, some of the contours of the deal have changed. Initially, out of the 15,145 crores which was to be invested, Bodhi Tree was going to contribute 13,500 crores and the remaining portion was going to be contributed by Reliance. But now, Bodhi Tree is contributing 4,300 odd crores and the majority is going to be invested by Reliance. Now, post the deal, on a fully diluted basis, Reliance's stake in Viacom 18 will be 60 odd percent, TV 18 will hold 13.5 percent and both Bodhi Tree and Paramount will hold 13 percent stake each. The second interesting bit is the valuation bit. Based on Bodhi Chi's investment, the suggestive valuation of Viacom 18 is close to 33,000 crores. TV 18's share in this would be close to 4,450 uh, 4, odd crores, suggesting that the residual value of TV 18 business is close to 700 crores when you compare it to their current market cap, giving it a significant value, uh, valuation upside from their current levels. All right. The other stock is Camlin Fine, which is buzzing in trade after Infinity Holdings, along with the promoter Ashish Dandekar, launched an open offer of a 26% stake in Camlin Fine. Sonal is here with more details on that. Sonal, over to you. Well, yes, the stock is on our radar because now after this particular open offer that Infinity Holdings has come out with, they will become co-promoters of the company. So the news first up is that Infinity Holdings, along with another promoter, Ashish Dandekar, they have launched an open offer. This is for 26% stake in the company at 160 rupees per share. So that 26% stake would mean, mean around 4.45 crore shares. Infinity Holdings, as of December 2022, had a big chunk in the company, close to 23.02% stake. This is after back in 2020, they invested for around 22.6% stake in the company. This was via a Warren's conversion. Promoter Ashish Dandekar, who is also the one who has, uh, who has launched this open offer, held around 9.44% stake. And together, all the promoters have hold, uh, are holding around 17.5% stake in the company. Infinity Holdings and another investor, Anfima NV, will be classified as promoters post this open offer if it is successful. In the offer document, they also say that assuming full acceptance of the offer, Infinity Holdings, uh, the promoter Ashish Dandekar and Anfima NV, they will hold around 55.76% stake in the company. But of course, it depends on whether this open offer is successful or not. I was just looking at some of the investments that Infinity Holdings had made. Uh, some interesting names here. In Onward Technologies, it's around 24.3% stake that they have here. ADF Foods, around 13.6%. Wellspin India, 1.3%. Borosilt Renewables, 5.96%. And Hindustan Foods, around 4.5%. So other interesting names to look at as far as Infinity Holdings investments are concerned. Okay, all right, Sonal, thanks very much for that. So, Camlin Fine buzzing today up around 6.5%. Remember, 52-week high for the stock is 174.6 rupees and the current market price is 163. So, probably, who knows, inching towards those levels. But let's move forward then in our special segment, Quarter Se Quarter Tak. Manglam is at the big wall. He's taking us through the expectations from the FMCG sector this quarter. Well, the FMCG sector is providing some relief in an otherwise IT-battered market today. So before we, you know, deep dive into the expectations, let put, let's put the key result dates for FMCG companies out. We have Nestle and Tata Consumer on April 25th, HUL on April 27th, and the next month we have Dabur, Marico, as well as Asian Paints between May 4th as well as May 11th itself. What is it that we can expect from these companies? So it's looking like we might see a return of volume growth this time around and some gradual improvement in rural demand. However, it looks like urban areas will still outperform rural ones. And we might also see some easing in raw material inflation from the last quarter levels itself. And that will be a welcome change. Let's look at what we already know from the fourth quarter updates. We start with Titan, which had an overall growth of 25% and a jewellery business growth of 23% on a favourable base. GCPL and Marico both reported similar numbers. Double-digit revenue growth, mid-single-digit volume growth and EBITDA growing ahead of revenue. Dabur was an underperformer there because of its divergence from the other FMCG companies. Only mid-single-digit revenue growth and margins declining by 200 to 250 basis points. In terms of volume growth expectations, analysts are expecting Asian paints to post around 10 to 12 percent volume growth, HUL Britannia in the middling range of 5 to 6 percent, ITC cigarettes likely to grow between 10 to 12 percent in terms of volumes, and Nestle too 
volume growth of around 4 to 5 percent. But apart from these numbers, what else should we be keeping an eye on? Given the heat wave, it will be important to watch the performance of summer portfolios of companies. Most important in FMCG numbers is not the numbers, but the management commentary on demand recovery. And importantly, see how rural business is, uh, you know, expected. Importantly, we'll also watch out for what the company is doing with regards to passing the price cuts to, uh, you know, consumers at the same time, reinvesting their cost reductions into advertisements and marketing too. And finally, the FMCG sector, which has never been cheap, valuations have always been high. We've seen the valuations come off their highs and now they're closer to their 10-year averages than what they've been in the past couple of years. So case in point, Marico currently 43 times, 10-year average 37 times. Titan currently 60 times, but 10-year average is at 50 times. Dabur at the 10-year average, as is Britannia. Similar is the case for HUL as well. Okay, well, today a lot of these stocks are doing quite well in trade. So, across the board, the biggest nifty gainers and the ones that are preventing the market from falling are names like Nestle, India, Britannia, all HUL, ITC, all the big movers. Let's do one thing. Let us slip into a quick break on that note. On the other side of the break, Jay Thakkar of Sher Khan will be joining in with some trading strategies. Keep it with CNBC TV. Welcome back. Uh, let's take a look at the markets. We have the Nifty Bank mildly in the green right now. In fact, if we just take a look at the way the Nifty has uh, performed as well, you know, today is low and extremely crucial one for the markets because we opened lower th thanks to Infosys and from there we've seen a sh swift recovery. But technically as well, where the Nifty bounced back from was the 200-day moving average. Today's low, 17,574, where was the 200-day moving average? This is about 17 points below that, so 17,558 is an important support zone. For the Nifty Bank, despite the weakness in HDFC Bank, we're seeing the Nifty Bank hold on to the 100-day moving average, which it captured on Thursday. So that's a positive. If you just take a look at the Nifty contribution chart as well, right now the Nifty is down about 150 points. Take away Infosys and the impact of HDFC Bank, and the Nifty is actually in the positive. What are the contributing factors on the way up? We do have Kotak Mahindra Bank as well as ITC, both of them supporting the Nifty alongside all the other places. Uh, but in the FNO pack, if you're just taking a look at, uh, you know, uh, a couple of stocks, Infosys definitely the stock of the day. So let's look at Infosys uh, uh, active options. 1200 put is the most active in trade, has the highest open interest, the stock at around 1241. So that's telling you that the street still believes that 1200, there are strong buyers and maybe it will not break that mark even if it falls further from here. But does it rise and go past the 1300 mark? Bears believe no, because the 1300 call sees the highest open interest addition. So we expect in, in, in forces to, you know, meander between this 1200 to sort of 1300 kind of range. And these are options that expire at the end of the month. So this is the range that we're talking about through the month itself. For this week, the Nifty 17,700 call and put, both of them extremely active for a combined premium of 150 rupees. Again, tying in with that 200-day moving average at the lower level for support, which is 17,550. And on the way up, 17,850 would continue to be a bit of resistance, which again ties in with the 100-day moving average. Okay. All right, Manglam. Well, let's get to Jay Thakkar then, uh, who joins in to discuss the technicals of the market. Jay, hi. Welcome to the show. Uh, if you could just start by giving us sen a sense in terms of how you would approach the entire IT space and on the contrary, financials. Hi, uh, you know, uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, well, as far as the you know IT pack is concerned, I would say that there has been definitely a breakdown in the Nifty IT index now, and uh, the uh, results of Infosys has really reversed the overall trend uh, for the uh, Nifty IT, and I think that the medium term down or negative going forward as well. I mean, any bounce in IT should be definitely used as an exit or a setting opportunity because it has uh, you know, broken its previous swing lows. The momentum has got into the sell mode on the weekly charts, which is not comfortable or favorable for the uh, short term, I would say short to medium term. Hence, the overall trend for the Nifty IT is going to be weak. The financial uh, overall view is positive. I would say that Bank Nifty has uh, really taken off the swing high of 47, uh, 42,000 levels on the upside. In fact, it has closed above 41,700, 800 range uh, after a long time. So now going forward, 41,500 will act as a very crucial support. And in those levels are held, Bank Nifty has a fair chance, you know, uh, moving oh, 3,000 uh, in the coming few weeks. So overall, uh, no. 
momentum is there out in the you know, financials and uh, you know banking space out here. Uh, the IT is looking uh, sideways to negative. The uh, intraday view, however, for both Nifty and Bank Nifty from here on is a bit positive. I would see that you know there can be some bounce back until the levels of 17,750 on Nifty. But then for Nifty to take off 17,850 in the short term or immediate basis looks unlikely. I think that Nifty will consolidate within a price band of 17,500 to 17,850. So one can buy on dips and sell on rise. That could be the strategy at least for this weekly expiry uh, going forward. And for the bank, Nifty, it, could, it, it will be definitely buy on dips uh, because out there uh, the relative outperformance is likely to stay. Uh, I have two buy recommendations for today. The first one is on ITC, which you mentioned about as well as which is contributing quite well in today's trading session along with Kotak Mahindra Bank. So ITC has provided a breakout from its 10% uh, you know, range. So it was consolidating within a range of 395, uh, 365, roughly around 300. Mm. All right. Uh, and that has provided a breakout on the upside. So the next target for ITC. And uh, second buy recommendation is on TVS Motors. I mean, here okay. the stock has provided a breakout from a simple triangle pattern. So the target on the upside comes to 12.50. One can buy this with a stock close of 11.30. Okay, thanks a lot. By the way, ITC has hit a fresh record high yes. today. We were just, uh, you know, showing it to you on our ticker. So 400 rupees, fresh record high and what a run it's been. Despite all the volatility in 2023, ITC is up over 20%. Uh, so that's the kind of up move. I mean, it was, you know, last year, of course, it was the biggest uh, recipient of all the memes. But then it turned around and... Uh, uh, went home uh, with the biggest a year stuff. and a half or maybe <laughs> a little over two years ago where uh, they were saying that ITC never crosses 200. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's at 400. Just the last one year, the Nifty is up just around 1%. ITC is up 50%. This is of course after multiple years of underperformance. Underperform. But what an outperformer. 50% outperformance as against the Nifty. And you know, we were talking to the analyst a while back and I was asking him about the uh, performance this year in this quarter. Uh, and last quarter, I mean, of course, y you know better than anyone that 15 to 18% growth that they saw in the cigarette business, yeah. right? I mean, that was something that he said that, you know, there is a scope for the company to continue its performance. Yeah. So 10 that's to 12% volume yeah, 10 growth is what they are expecting this quarter. In this well. quarter, yeah. So the double digit growth is something that can continue despite the run up. But Jay, uh, just one follow up question. You said that ITC is your uh, one of your picks. Okay, I think uh, Jay is not with us. So <laughs> we'll do one thing. Uh, we will uh, take a quick break on that note. On the other side of the break, lots more coming up. But the market is still doing pretty well in terms of not the headline index, but uh, beneath the surface X of IT, there are a lot of stocks that are doing well. So we'll talk more about that in greater detail. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Halftime Report. Well, let's focus on a CNBC TV an exclusive now. Sources tell us that the IRDAI has revived its plan to launch the Bima Sugam that was said to be an Amazon-like platform for insurance products. Yash is here with all the details. Yash, over to you. Well, Sonia, there was uh, evident interest uh, about this Amazon-like platform for sales, servicing and claims for insurance policies. But seemed like uh, the plan almost got forgotten for a very long time. But what we've been given to understand, uh, which is the latest here, is that the insurance regulator, IRDAI, has uh, sort of revived this particular plan to launch Bhima Sugam. What we've been given to understand is that IRDI chairman recently met uh, the CEOs of All Life uh, General as well as Standalone Health Insurance Company to discuss the basic framework in terms of how this plan would go forward. The first thing that we've been able to pick up is that uh, essentially as far as the framework itself is concerned, uh, very soon uh, there could be RFPs or requests for proposals when it comes to service providers as far as this exchange itself is concerned. Also, what we've been given to understand as far as stakeholders are concerned, uh, Life Insurance Council and through the council, all life insurance companies and the General Insurance Council will have 45% uh, stake each as far as the platform is concerned. All life in general and standalone health insurance companies will have equitable stake as far as those individual 45% holding itself is concerned. The balance 10% is concerned will be with uh, uh, insurance aggregators, service providers as well as the agent body. As far as the capital itself is concerned, the initial capital which Bhima Sugam would look to raise would be around 100 crore rupees uh, which will essentially come through this particular stake which will be given to the different companies and one big concern in the previous avatar was that how will uh, the 
exchange raise money when it comes to its operating expenses. Here, what uh, one suggestion has come is that for every transaction, be it buying of insurance policies or settling of claim uh, or even inquiries, will have uh, 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 funds allocated to it in which, uh, which will be essentially the money paid by insurance companies uh, to the exchange and that's how the exchange would raise funds for its operational expenses. As far as implementation itself is concerned, we've been given to understand that the implementation of Bhima Sugam could happen in three phases. In the first phase, it will only be used for data which will be required by all live general and standalone health insurance companies. Then standard products or basic products will be listed on the exchange and then all the products, life and general insurance products will be listed on the exchange. Okay, all right, Yash, uh, thanks very much for that. Well, let's move back to the big story then after the Infosys shocker and a big downgrade for TechM, which has hit sentiment in the IT space. A host of mid-cap IT stocks are now trading under pressure. Reema's back with us. It's been a busy weekend and a busy day. Reema, tell, uh, tell us uh, what is the read-through for the broader markets? Well, you know, I think the big risk for mid-cap IT now is that most of these IT companies, mid-cap IT companies, are trading at a significant premium to their large caps and also compared to their uh, pre-COVID average multiples. So if there is an earnings risk, because they're trading at such a valuation premium, there is a risk of PE compression. Secondly, most IT companies have indicated that when times are tough, when the consolidation takes place. And when the consolidation typically favors the large caps over the mid-cap IT company. If that is the case, can mid-cap IT continue to grow at a faster pace than large cap? Up until now, for the last many years, five, six years at least, mid-cap IT was growing faster than large caps, which is why they were commanding a valuation premium. If that's not the case, will that valuation premium now shrink? Just take a look at the valuation multiples of some of the mid-cap IT companies and how they compare with the pre-COVID average multiples from FI15 to FI20, and you would see that they are trading at a significant premium. Second plate, which will come up, will show you that tier two IT companies, its mid-cap IT companies, were trading much faster, were growing much faster than the large-cap IT companies. Uh, and Street was penciling in that this large growth differential between mid-caps and and large caps will continue in the future. But as I said, if vendor consolidation hurts mid-cap IT companies, then mid-cap IT companies may not con grow at such a fast clip compared to the frontliners and the growth differential between the two may narrow down and that could be a risk for mid-cap IT companies. Back to you. Okay, Reema, thanks a lot for that. So uh, that's a read-through on mid-cap IT companies after what Infosys and TC has delivered. Let's do one thing. Let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll take a break from IT as well and put the focus on Z Entertainment and Zomato. Two stocks that are buzzing. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back. Uh, well, the other stock in focus is Z Entertainment, which is trading lower after a big block deal, which has taken place. Uh, Vivek is here to give us more perspective on this, Vivek. Well, absolutely. You know, uh, today during market hours, you actually saw a very large block deal of over 5.6% stake, you know, that exchanged hands as far as Z Entertainment was concerned. So now, you know, yesterday we did have access to the term sheet of the likely block deal and we understand that Oppenheimer has completely exited its 5.65% stake you know via this particular block deal we understand that you know the floor price for this particular block deal was at around 200 rupees a share but we also understand that uh, you know the actual deal took place at a price slightly higher than that so the total offer size the total block that has exchanged hands is over 1130 crore interesting to see the list of buyers in today's uh, you know a, a deal that will be uploaded onto the exchanges post market as uh, but the last block deal and it's a clean out trade as far as oppenheimer is concerned Right, a clean out, clean out trade on uh, Z from Oppenheimer. At the same time, I'm watching out for Zomato today, and that's because there's been an interesting note which has come in from Motilal Oswal. Now, increasingly, people have been, you know, getting a little more positive on Zomato. The stock is uh, under pressure today, but, uh, you know, Motilal Oswal believes that from a long-term standpoint, this is a buy, and uh, the target price is at 70. Why is that? Because, one, for the food delivery industry itself, there are three things which are driving growth. One, intensifying internet penetration. Secondly, rising consumption. And thirdly, growth in urbanization. So what does all of this mean for Zomato's business? The food delivery market in India 
could grow by about 19% CAGR over the next couple of years. And in that, online share of food ordering, which was about 13% in FY21, could go all the way up to 24%. Zomato, being the dominant player out there, could see its revenue grow at a CAGR of 29%. It could compound by 29% over FY23 to FY25. And what does all of this mean for their profitability? By FY25, they could be profitable despite elevated competitive, uh, competitive intensity. So it's for these factors that Motilal believes that over the next one year or so, it's a good buying bet. Okay, good buying bet. Uh, Zomato, that is, it's down about 1.5% today, so not really reacting uh, to the report. But 70 rupees is the target price that uh, Motila Loswal has. Let's step into a quick break. On the other side, Manisha Gupta will be joining in. She has with her Kunal Shah of Nirmal Bank Commodities. Do stay tuned in. Welcome back and joining us on the show now is Kunal Shah from Nirmal Bank Commodities. Kunal, hi, good to have you. I want to start with the metal prices because that is a sector that seems to be doing quite well today. We've seen zinc outperform, copper trading near three-week highs. And when you look at the last three, six or seven trading sessions, we've seen many of these metal prices gain anywhere between 3 to 6%, 6% in case of nickel, by the way. How do you look at the sector and do you think it's a good buying opportunity now emerging? So first, uh, metal prices are moving up on the back of weaker dollar. Uh, yeah. Every time we've seen the weakness in dollar has been attributed to the higher metal prices because it is dollar denominated. The directional view of the US dollar seems to be on the downside. We are expecting that going forward, dollar index is likely to drift below even 100 and we are going to see 98, 97 kind of levels for the dollar index, which is slightly bullish. And second, most important factor is China. So tomorrow we are going to see Chinese GDP numbers, industrial production number, and we are going to see a bit of recovery taking place in Chinese GDP, Chinese industrial production, because of the kind of uh, inflow. Uh, we've seen a huge uh, liquidity infusion by the Chinese government in the last three months, which is aiding the growth. 50% of the metal consumption still takes place in China, and mm -hmm. any better than expected data in China leads to a higher metal prices. So we are expecting some bit of pullback in uh, prices. Not a structural bullish view, but we are expecting because of the weaker dollar and metal uh, consumption likely to revive from here because of the better data. Copper prices, zinc prices can move a tad higher from here. Uh, zinc can test levels of 260 to 265. Copper can test levels of 800 rupees, 800 to 805 rupees. So slight uh, uh, uptick in metal prices is expected because of the stronger data from China. Mm, all right. How are you looking at the other metals? I mean, silver, for example, is still trading near one-year highs in the international market, 75,000 rupees per kg holding in the Indian markets as well. So with the strength in gold, with the strength now coming back for industrial metals, would you say silver is in a more sweeter spot? Yeah, uh, the fundamental of silver from the demand perspective is very bullish. We have seen the demand of silver increasing. So we are expecting even double-digit growth going forward in silver demand. And at the same time, from last 10 years, the supply side have been very muted. We have not seen any major growth in supply. The scrap supply keeps coming in the market, but this is for the first time, in spite of the fact the prices have gone up, uh, scrap supply is not able to bring down the prices. So the inherent strength in the demand is basically causing the upside in silver futures. And uh, we are expecting this trend to continue going forward. And silver prices are heading towards $27, $28 on CME. And on Indian bosses, it is likely to head headed towards 80,000 to 85,000. So uh, I think silver is going to outperform in precious metals. 
Hmm. And gold, you know, uh, this is going to be a third straight week, fourth rather, because for the last three weeks, we've constantly seen uh, gold prices and be mm -hmm. able to hold around that $2,000 per ounce mark. What is the range that you see building up for this one now? Because most banks and brokerages are reiterating that 2050, 2150 is where we could be headed. Yeah, so after, uh, uh, like you rightly said, you know, we've seen a constant upside in gold futures. I think it is consolidating right now. We have seen a major spike, uh, almost uh, five to six thousand rupees upside in last two and a half months in gold on domestic market, and on CME from eighteen twenty dollars to almost two thousand and fifty dollars. So two hundred dollars of upside. So generally, gold gives you ten percent of return, and what that is what we've seen in last two to three months. So it is consolidating. The trend is still very bullish. I am still expecting gold to test. $2,100 and $2,150 in this year. And uh, whatever downside, what we are uh, witnessing right now, we've seen a profit taking to the tune of $30, $40. Another $30, $40, $19 or $80 seems to be the bottom for CME futures gold. And I'm expecting gold to again resume its upper trajectory. Uh, geopolitical uh, tensions are increasing. Uh, Russia is in a no, uh, Russia is not showing any sign of peace talks. China, Taiwan, so weaker dollar, geopolitical tension, and going forward, the uh, rate hike cycle will come to an end after two, three months, whenever. So this all re makes me believe that the U.S. economy also likely to slow down. So all factors are pointing towards bullish scenario for gold, and 2150 seems to be the target for me. Okay. Kunal, a big question that everybody's asking is on whether even these levels are good to buy because while everybody has witnessed a decline in equities and strength in gold, it's very less and uh, even the portfolios which had gold was a very low quantity there. So most people feel that they clearly have missed it in the first quarter. Where do you see the second quarter and the third quarter now building up? And these current levels, what would your advice be for people who want to include it in their portfolios? Yeah, it's a, it's a very a good question. So most of the people are wondering whether we are buying at all-time high, whether we'll make, a, uh, uh, we'll make it the top. Uh, I don't think so. The last time gold hit $2,000, at that time, U.S. Fed's balance sheet was $4.5 trillion. This time, the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve's uh, balance sheet is almost $8.6 trillion. So gold is still a value buy, as per my understanding. And we are going to see at least next two years I'm not forecasting for five years, 10 years, but at least for next two years, the bull run in gold is likely to continue, uh, mainly because of the problems which have been created by the irresponsible printing by the Western central banks. So I am I, of the very firm view that even at these levels, if you buy, you are still going to make 10% return, 10% uh, CAGI return for next two years at least. So uh, even you can invest in the, at these levels. I'm very confident it should move up going forward. All right. And when you say that you're expecting dollar index to go to 100, even fall below 100, what would that in sense mean for the crude oil prices then? Because here as well, we are trading at a one month highs as we speak. Yeah, it's a big paradox uh, as far as how the markets functions, you know, the moment dollar index weakens. So basically everyone wants to uh, bring down the inflation. And when the fundamental of dollar is indicating that it is going to for the uh, uh, further weakness we are going to see at that time the commodity will again move up so uh, till one point uh, inflation will go down uh, right now the inflation is mainly coming off from the housing sector in the us but now uh, slowly gradually even commodity will add up to that uh, i am expecting oil to move up 85 dollars for the wti 92 dollars 91 dollars for the brent and mainly because of the weaker dollar and revival in Chinese demand to a certain extent, but I'm not expecting any very bullish trend where it is going to test hundred dollars and go above hundred dollars. So OPEC production cuts are helping uh, right now for prices to recover. So uh, some bit of pullback is expected going forward, but not very bullish to the tune of hundred dollar to hundred twenty dollar. That kind of levels I'm not expecting still.
Okay. All right, Kunal uh, Manisha, thank you so much for joining in and giving us a wrap of all things commodities, crude in specific. But, you know, just keep an eye out of the markets. We're seeing a big recovery from the lows on the Nifty Bank, which is now up about 100 odd points. And this, remember, despite some weakness that we're facing from its biggest component, which is HDFC Bank. What is powering the Nifty Bank ahead? We've seen a big move come by from Kotak Mahindra Bank this morning. And now it is uh, the baton which has been passed to SBI. So State Bank of India comes up for you. And taking it higher along, I mean, take, uh, SBI along with the Nifty Bank, it's also taken a big uh, uh, move uh, on the Nifty PSU Bank Index, which is up by about 2.5%. So one of those other indices which is outperforming in today's trading session along with FMCG. Speaking of FMCG, a big move is underway on Nestle. I wonder what it is all about. Uncharacteristic for Nestle to move really 800 rupees in a day. A 4% uh, jump is what we're witnessing. Remember, the company reports its results next week. So the street is anticipating a decent growth come by from its uh, urban business, which has uh, a higher proportion in revenue share. At the same time, some sort of uh, announcement, anything related to any sort of m and is something that we'll keep an eye out on. And ITC continues to power ahead with a 401 rupee mark near its share price right now at a record high. With that, we're out of time on this edition of Halftime Report. Do stay tuned. Business Lunch takes all the market action.